Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Made in Miami, where we're interviewing different businesses that are making it in Miami and have them share their stories, what they love about Miami, and why doing business in Miami is such a good idea. Today, I'm going to be interviewing both Angel and Angel Danielle from Ray's Cleaners, and let's get started. Hi. Hello, Hi. Jordi. Hey. <laughs> Wait, so first of all, give us your name and the name of the business, and then how can people find you best? Okay, well, my name is Angel um, Suarez, Angel Suarez, and I am his uh, proud dad. <laughs> we, um, how can people find us best? Yeah. Um, I guess that the best way to find us is if you have something that needs cleaning <laughs> and you go and ask most of the major boutiques in the area or the stores and they most likely will recommend you to raise cleaners. Raise cleaners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, my name is Angel Daniel Suarez. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can find us on, on the web at www.raisecleaners.com. Okay. That's the easiest way. That's the easiest way. Okay, good. So please give us a brief explanation of why and how you started this business. And what is it exactly that you do? Okay, um, well, this business or the dry cleaning business, the reason that I get into the dry cleaning business was because of a particular need at a moment. My mom had started a dry cleaning company um, in uh, Northside Shopping Center in, in the black neighborhood of Miami. And in 1981, when my father passed away, I joined her because I had uh, failed at another business. Okay. And uh, she allowed me to go work with her. And she said, if you like it, you can stay. And if you don't, then whenever you're ready, you move on to bigger and better things. But I really enjoyed the dry cleaning business because it was a repeat business. And if you did well by the clients, if you did a, gave them a good product, they would come back the next week. Mm. And they would come back the next week and, and they would tell their friends and their friends would come back, would come and see you. So coming from a background of uh, furniture and appliances, which is what, what I did for many, many years uh, with my father, where you needed to have uh, thousands of dollars in inventory. And if mm -hmm. uh, it went past the time that it was in vogue, you would have all this old inventory you couldn't sell. This was a new business where people would bring you the inventory, their dirty clothes, uh -huh. and you would turn it into clean, <laughs> crispy, uh, bright clothes. There you go. So it, was a, it's a, it was a winner. Yeah. And um, in 1983, uh, race cleaners came up uh, for sale and we found out because my mother had a banker who was also the banker for the original owner of race cleaners and it so happens that I had gone to high school with uh, his son oh. so I knew about them and I actually did work with them one afternoon um, uh, back in the 70s um, where they needed a driver and I was a friend of his and I filled in for the driver and <laughs> who was to say that so many years later I was be I would be in the uh, in, in the same in the same seat Wow so that's how it all started okay and, uh, that's where we've been so Angel Danielle how come you came into the business well myself and my siblings we all grew up in the business yeah on our weekends on our holidays uh, every possible chance that um, we could be working, they had us working. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's because of how rambunctious I was that they would send me there and uh, 
from a really young age, um, my father kind of split us into these positions where um, I learned a lot of <clears throat> the production aspect of the business at a really young age. And uh, it served me well in that when I, at a very young age, as a producer, I was good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was sort of like in, in the, it was in the coffee. It was in, the, <laughs> it was in your, and so um, when I, I actually um, uh, studied music in English and somehow oh. um, as we got married and we, and we made a family, um, it was just a great opportunity to go and, and you know, work in the family business and mm -hmm. uh, to, so we, that's how we landed there. And, there you go. And now uh, I brought my wife in and <laughs> we were all in there. It's a true family business. It's a true family yes. business. Well, this next question is a little bit answered already. They, do you think that you were destined to be in this business? Well, in retrospect, I think it was. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it became uh, my mother, who had never worked a day in her life. Um, when we moved from, uh, we, we, we were raised in Puerto Rico, and when we moved from Puerto Rico to Miami, um, she found herself with nothing to do at home. So she got herself a part-time job as a seamstress in the neighborhood dry cleaning. So it just turned all the way around that at the end, uh, it seemed like when my father died, I would continue on my mother's path. And she gave me the opportunity of running the business and we grew, we grew the business to wherever we could. Um, so I was full of ideas and full <laughs> of energy. And, and in retrospect, yeah, I think it was part of my, uh, uh, the, the aura that that's that's where that's where it was leading to and your mom is still alive how my old mother, is your mom my mother is 91 years old 91 and she's still and she's still kicking like she's, she's still alive <laughs> she's very much full of of energy and still clients uh, ask for her oh wow still to this day clients still ask for her yeah, yeah. that's great yeah. and then angel and yeah you come along with your ideas and it just seems like it's part of the family's nature to be entrepreneurial and innovative. Absolutely. I, I, it's funny, it's something that I have commented to him uh, where I've observed other families who come from a long line of uh, lawyers and you'll see them talking to their sons who are thinking about going on to college or studying uh, under, you know, going to a specific firm or reaching out to a specific judge and they'll tell him, well, what? How do you want to fast track your career? Do you want to be a politician? Do you want to end up in the corporate world? How do you want to? And I and I would see the father kind of helping him pave his path in law to whatever his end game was, and um, and it, and in our dinner table, the conversation was always, you know, you could monetize that, you can take that and break it down, <laughs> and, break it. and and so that's that's really a, a lot of how we've grown up is uh, with an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely. What do you find most challenging about this business? Today, I think the most challenging part of this business is the lack of help. It's very difficult to find uh, people. We had probably at one time uh, old timers that had grown in this business uh, from childhood and they were masters at this craft. Mm. Um, that you can't find anymore. You have to create them now. You have to basically train people. And some of them are very good and some of them are not. Some right. of them, you know, they don't stay with us too long, but some of them that are good will have stayed with us for many, many years. And we have taught them the craft. Um, it's interesting you speak about it as a craft. Because in your business, it really is a craft. It is, uh, because this is one one business that as much um, uh, inventions or, or um, automation has been created, nothing has been created to replace the one person and the relationship between that one person and that one garment. Mm. See, in the dry cleaning business, except for the cleaning department, where we can handle 
you know, 50 pounds of garments in one load, everything else is a one-to-one -one relationship. Mm. It's a relationship between one person and one garment at all times. Hmm. So it, we have not been able to find any uh, equipment that has been able to replace that. Not at the level that you all operate no. at, right? Correct. Yeah. And so one of the biggest frustrations is finding people where we are offering entry level jobs for the most part. And with today's um, economy and other opportunities, very, very difficult to find people that are interested in coming to work at 100 degrees uh, you know, <laughs> during the summer. And, uh, and loving and loving this business. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we do find some, but it's not. Uh, so that's that's, that's a one challenge. Of the, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges that we find. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you agree with that, or do you have anything else to add? That is definitely a, a big challenge in our industry. Um, I think another challenge that we face is uh, the change in trend with fashion. <clears throat> uh, number one after the the bubble burst and uh and everybody was sort of coming out of of the the wreckage um even high-end designers were finding themselves cannibalizing their own product and offering something for less which i think ultimately made it a very astute consumer but by the same token also uh created very disposable clothing mm. and so before where you also inside of what we do our speciality um you really see it sort of go for a spin when you see something heavily embellished or you know very intricate in, in terms of design and fabrication and nowadays the stick the sticker price for something like that is a very simple dress with not too much in terms of ornament and so um while you still need the expertise it's not as easily seen or displayed mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how how you you know what like you can why do. you would invest mm -hmm. right that much in the protection of this garment right although actually some of the young people that i've spoken with they're really interested in the longevity of the things that they have like there was a disposable kind of mindset but they're also going you know what no we're not interested in waste the way mm -hmm. that it used to be even a decade ago or right. five years ago. So that may be turning itself around. And yeah. that is an, an advantage of dealing with a, a reputable dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. There's many dry cleaners out there that offer the same service uh, of cleaning the garment, but they cut a lot of corners that make your garment not last as long. Right. Um, so we try always to use the best uh, detergents available. Uh, right now we use detergents that uh, come from Germany. They're the latest oh, really? uh, technology in, in technology because it is a technology to to be able to remove stains. Uh, at the same time that you're trying to avoid uh, as much mechanical action with a garment so that the garment will last longer. Um, we also use um, very expensive equipment that regenerates the solvents, regenerates the uh, mm. waste and we are using right now biodegradable solutions which also help in in the environment and uh, make your your garments uh, because of all the things that we do that you don't see because right. are the things that you don't see are the ones that create that longevity in your garment i have garments that i've owned for 20 years yeah and they're still like new and i and i am the type of person that i take it off today and tomorrow is at the cleaners i don't use it twice Mm -hmm. and they last for a very long time you know you because take, they're cared for if you take proper care of your garments mm -hmm. that investment especially when you're dealing in the high-end market where you're maybe spending eight or ten thousand dollars for a dress you want that garment to last because sometimes those garments if they're made by a specific designer could be worth more money in the long in the oh long yeah time. Oh, you I know one day I was at your at your mm -hmm. uh, production facility and you were talking about how you had to remove the lining of the dress and then re right. put it back in. And I was like, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. That's so above and beyond anything I would have expected um, for you to do. But it wasn't going to be safe for the actual outer fabric right. if you didn't. 
And that was just a conversation that was a normal conversation for you guys. Because the designers are create beauty, but they don't create <laughs> uh, they're not anything. thinking about cleaning they're it, not right? Thinking about cleaning. <laughs> they're not so they may be using more than one type of garment or or, or yeah. fabric. Mm -hmm. And you in that case, particular case, you had a linen dress. I uh, I remember specifically it was a yeah. yellow yeah. linen dress that was lined in a red silk. So beautiful, the, but beautiful, but different the, red, dye. the red silk bleeds and the actual yellow of the dress had turned through the years. Yeah. into a different tone of, of yellow. Yeah. So we had to remove the lining, clean the uh, the uh, linen part on its own in order to bring back the luster and the the, the original color yeah. of the dress. Amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And then yeah. put it all back together. <laughs> so angels, what, yeah, that was great, angels. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is the biggest obstacle that you've overcome in this business? The biggest obstacle that I've seen in the, I'm gonna say, what is it, 35 or 36 years that I've been in this business, um, was actually the the uh, down the downturn of the economy in uh, mm -hmm. in uh, 2009. Uh, was it? Yeah, 2008, 2009. 2008, yeah. 2009. Um, we had. Um, we had done an acquisition at that moment uh, of a group of stores um, and, and the uh, economy didn't help us. So it has been quite um, an ordeal to get back into, into what we know. Instead of doing what we loved and what we knew, we became more of financial experts <laughs> in order to survive the, yeah. uh, the uh, downturn. It made us also a lot uh, uh, to think out, outside of the box at the same time because when the high-end market dropped, which was the first one to drop, uh, we had to come out and, and locate how we're, we could do business at a lower price structure. Mm -hmm. So we created new services that we could do in order not to lose our clients. Mm -hmm. um, so it helped us a lot in, in learning other things, other avenues that are business. Um, we had never experienced before. Right. So, but that was the biggest uh, stumbling block, and uh, and we survived. I mean, we've been in business for since 1981. Wow. That I started working with my mom in her um, in her first store. Mm -hmm. And you bought and, the business from her, right? And then when we when I moved when we moved to Race, um, um, I would say about eight or ten years later, I was able to buy it from her. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest obstacle that you've overcome in the business? Um, I'd have to agree that that downturn was really something to to reckon with. Uh, and inside of that, I felt like the biggest challenge we, we faced in that climate was that um, we were always your quintessential mom and pop shop we had a very small footprint uh, in production so we controlled a lot of the demand on our product and the people that worked for us were not only with us for many years but it was a short it was a small group of us it was a very family oriented all around and overnight that acquisition we grew from maybe 40 some odd employees to 126, <laughs> of which we didn't know these people whatsoever um, overnight. Uh, we went to into a multi-location, uh, uh, multi-units overnight and not small potatoes. I mean, we dried out for, what is it, seven plants S in six, two six months, months. Mm -hmm. something outrageous like that. Um, and so it was also learning, you know, it was learning dry cleaning all over again because it was uh, going from the uber high end where you were uh, the elite into a whole other market that had its own other, its own set of rules. Mm -hmm. And I think we came into it with a little bit of arrogance that kind of, we ate some humble pie there for sure. It was definitely a good lesson. <laughs> we got a good whooping. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, so that was a, a very big challenge. I mean, that was, to say the least. Uh, mm -hmm. And you overcame it. 
You're still and here. We overcame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you could start this business over again, what would you do differently? What would you tell Angel, younger Very Angel? Younger, younger Angel. The funny thing is that we've discussed this before. And, uh, <laughs> and what I would do is I would have stayed small. Mm. I would not have grown to, at one time we had 25 locations uh, with different brands and um, 10 trucks out on the street. Um, and what we did was that we just uh, leveraged ourselves out to different markets and we were not paying attention to the real thing that what, what we really loved to do. Mm -hmm. So I would have I would have stayed in a small lo smaller location, um, and and kept my production con under control. And if you wanted to have my services, then you would have had to pay a lot more. Mm -hmm. But it would have been a lot more. Um, uh, what would I say? Exclusive. Okay. Than than what it was. In in turn, what we did was that we tried to make the high-end dry cleaning more uh, approachable. approachable to people because, yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of clients still think that we're very expensive, but when you compare our prices to Chicago or to New York City, to the high-end stores in New York City where they're getting $100 for a suit or $80 for a suit, we're still a bargain at $56 a suit. Okay. You know, so for what we give, but right. if we would have stayed at that level of just doing what we knew best and do the smaller amount or the, the lesser number of pieces, our prices would have been like New York. And there is there is a, a, a population in Miami that would have paid for those prices. Mm -hmm. uh, I Absolutely. Think Miami, I just heard in the news that Miami has now 30 billionaires. Yeah, that was in the Herald the other right. day. So, right. I mean, the, the market here is becoming very exclusive. And I think mm -hmm. that we, I, if I would have if I could do it all over again, I would have stayed on course with what we did and, and what we were good at. Yeah, so that's a great lesson for mm -hmm. other entrepreneurs as they're considering how to move and how to scale and move mm -hmm. forward is you know, we're losing sight of your core competency and your brand mm -hmm. advantage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so as entrepreneurs, you have to juggle many things. How do you stay focused and how do you refocus when you've lost that focus? You wanna start? How do you stay focused? By constantly being dissatisfied. I'm always in search of something unattainable, I'm always just a little bit closer, just a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, um, that's what keeps me focused. When I'm the most, um, I think that also when I'm the most frustrated or the most overwhelmed is when I'm, I think sometimes I'm finally getting someplace. <laughs> 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 no such thing as resting on your laurels, right? <laughs> okay, good. What would you say? Well, I think that one thing that keeps us uh, focused is that we meet with other dry cleaners in different states that are in the high-end dry cleaning market. And we discuss the issues that we, that we all share in common. And when we come back from these meetings, we come in with a new approach to and solutions to issues that we may be having. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that I like to, uh, as many times as I can, when I travel, try to stay at a better hotel, learn what they do for their clients, mm -hmm. what do they offer, um, uh, go to the better restaurants to see how they treat their clients, to see the experience that they're getting, mm -hmm. and to try to take those experiences in and uh, use them in our business, in how to approach our clients and give them more for what they're paying. Um, and that keeps us in, in line with that high-end mentality that we need to know. Yeah. Um, so it, it's something that, that we like to, to do and to, and to ferment and, and to uh, create. Okay, I think that you're, you're gonna love this question. Okay. <laughs> if you only had $1,000 to invest in the business, what would you invest it in? <laughs> Uh, 
never thought of that. Uh, if I had only $1,000, where would I invest it in my business? Mm -hmm. I probably would invest it in, in my best employee. Mm. I would find who is the best employee, the best producer, the one that cares more for our clients. And I would give her a thousand dollars worth of whatever makes her happy. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, Danielle? I think that I would um, spend it on finding a way to inspire the employee base on yeah. what would, how can we have them engage in a way that is satisfying to them so that they can really take ownership on, and they're part of the journey with us um, in this business. Beautiful. Yeah. So you invest in your team. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, you can each have this. What are three words you would use to describe your organization? Three words. Uh, I would say that we're in the forefront of our industry. Okay. Um, we are, we have knowledge of our industry and of our trade. Mm -hmm. um, and we're a happy bunch. <laughs> <In the end. laughs> so you're at the forefront, knowledgeable experts, mm -hmm. and a happy bunch. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say? <laughs> we are, uh, Old and wise, and young and scrappy, all at the same time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Old and wise, and young and scrappy. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. Of course, it's not three words, but you know they've been breaking the rules all along. <laughs> How long have you been in Miami? Um, I was born in Cuba in 1955, and we left Cuba in 1961. Uh, to uh, well, to Miami as a stopover, but we ended up in Puerto Rico. Uh, we were there until '69, and then in, at the end of '69, 19 or beginning of '70, we moved to Miami permanently. Um, then in 1974, my dad asked me to move back to Puerto Rico to help him with his business. And I did, and in '76 I got married, moved back to Puerto Rico with my wife. Oh, I didn't know that. And we lived there until Angel was born in 1978. Wow. Where we moved back to Miami, and then I've been here since 1978. Wow. Nonstop. I mean, but, but really it was 1970 when I came back to when I when I really moved to Miami. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've been here your whole life. Yeah, my whole life. Yeah. yeah. Great. So what's the best thing about doing business in Miami? What would you say is the best thing about doing business in Miami? Well, it has a uh, uh, Latin or Hispanic flavor that, that we like. Um, you can't beat our weather, can beat the sun. And when you feel like going to the beach, you have the beach right there. Uh -huh. And it's such a, uh, we have such a varied, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, population that you very can, diverse. Yeah, very diverse population. Uh -huh. uh, some, so you can experience almost everything here. Yeah. Um, it's funny because uh, one year, my my wife and I went to um, San Diego, which we loved, and on the West Coast, the experience is more Oriental than anything else. It's more of a pa uh, Pacific or Trans-Pacific mm -hmm. rather than, mm -hmm. than uh, Latin. Where in Miami, you have that Latin flavor. Yeah. And um, and I think it's great. I think that the Miami's weather and uh, uh, and the mix of people, it's just an excellent place to be. Okay. What would you say, Angel Daniel? What's the best thing about doing business in Miami? <clears throat> I never, I guess I'd never thought of it because I'd only ever done business in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so I like it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess culturally speaking, I've always found it interesting because uh, 
at work where as uh, in work i've always found that to the cuban population i'm american <laughs> to the american population i'm cuban and i think that that's always been interesting a first generation born cuban americans uh -huh. and, um, the, and the cubans don't know who we are <laughs> because we've been here for so long right and uh i think you know dry cleaning specific what i think is interesting is uh we see a specific mix of garments um and have to understand something about our climate that is unique to us whereas let's say people in the northeast or even parts of of the u.s where they actually feel a winter or they go through seasonal changes um they they go through other challenges you know right. warm, keeping your boiler warm in the winter and things like that but um knowing knowing where all of a sudden your piece count goes to 90 percent cotton linen and a hundred percent humidity and trying to make that crisp and, and mm -hmm. look good um that's something to reckon with for sure so um but as far as a difference i i, I guess those are the differences that i no. like about I, I also think that miami is a small city that wants to be big and he thinks big yeah, yeah. he wants to be new york but we're not new york you know we well, just yeah. um got awarded the uh j JP Morgan Chase mm -hmm. Advancing Cities Award, which is you know a huge deal because not every city won that that applied, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot going on here in Miami, yeah. yeah. And with the 30 billionaires and everything that's associated with that, lots and lots of opportunities in the city. We have more events now than ever that resemble. Uh, more the Northeast uh, mm -hmm. because we have such a population, a large population of Northeasterners here that come in for the uh, for the uh, winter, um, which is great for us. I mean, yeah. our, our business is basically um, busy from um, I would say end of May. Um, no, I'm sorry, uh, end of end of June through uh, November, or no, end of June. Well, the summer, the summer is dead. Let's put it June, right. June through September, through November, okay. we're dead. And November through uh, May, we're busy. <laughs> yeah. And right. it's, it's because we get this influx of, of people from, from the Northeast and other parts of the country. And then we have all these activities that happen during those uh, six months of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now we have a food and wine uh, event. We have uh, the Art Basel, we have uh, right. uh, the biggest boat shows in the country are, uh, happened here. Uh, so we have so many activities that are very attractive so, to so many people. So it always keeps Miami crisp and going and, and yeah. growing and moving. So I think that's one of, the, one of the advantages of being here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both for this interview and for being here today, sharing your wisdom. And that's Made in Miami.